Good afternoon from Oceans Live from Capitol Hill Ocean Week at the Museum in Washington, D.C. I am your host, Kate Thompson, for this afternoon's session of Capitol Hill Ocean Talk. Under the Nixon administration, two landmark pieces of legislation set the American stage for species conservation. In 1972, President Nixon signed the Marine Mammal Protection Act into law and followed it with the Endangered Species Act in 1973. More than 40 years later, the nation is exploring new approaches to species man management at the same time it confronts new challenges to species conservation that neither Congress, Nixon, nor the species themselves could have anticipated. With us in the studio this afternoon are three experts in the field of marine species conservation. First, we have Eileen Sobeck, the Assistant Administrator for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA Fisheries. In this role, she oversees the management and conservation of marine mammals, sea turtles, and coastal fisheries within the exclusive economic zone. Next, we have Dr. Francis Gulland, Commissioner for the U.S. Marine Mammal Commission and veterinarian at the Marine Mammal Center in Sausalito, California. Dr. Gulland has been actively involved in the veterinary care and rehabilitation of stranded marine mammals and research into marine mammal diseases there since 1994. And last, but certainly not least, we have Patrick Ramage, Director of the Whales Program at the International Fund for Animal Welfare. As Whale Program Director, Patrick leads IFAW's efforts to protect our planet's great whales from commercial whaling and the many other threats they face worldwide. Thank you so much for joining me in the studio this afternoon. I really appreciate it. This is a, a, a pretty uh, interesting and exciting topic we're about to go into. So Eileen, can you tell us a little bit about what the state of species conservation under the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act is right now? Yeah, great. Thank you, Kate, for having us today. Yeah. This is a really um, important topic, and uh, NOAA Fisheries deals with fisheries issues, but it's really important to recognize that we have this other function of protecting and conserving um, protected species. So where are we compared to where we were when the act started? Um, it's kind of a complex story. We have some good news stories. We have some, um, some species that are protected under, for instance, the Marine Mammal Protection Act that um, now are at... Um, at very sustainable levels, mm -hmm. higher levels than they have been for decades. Um, California sea lions, um, mm -hmm. uh, elephant seals, um, some good some good success stories. Um, the Endangered Species Act, the list of, of protected species does continue to increase. We have added species at NOAA recently in the last year, including 20 coral species, as new threats um, come to pass. Right, so what, what have the acts achieved for species across the nation? Um, I think it's a it's a combination of things. Um, part of it is making sure that in uh, federal decision making, we know what the effects are going to be on protected species and take it into account in a very direct way. It's also to prohibit um, uh, uh, certain kinds of act, acts and actions that have adverse effects on endangered species or marine mammals, depending on the species. And so where there were uh, there was specific activity, uh, um, I'm, I'm sure you can talk about whaling a little bit, mm -hmm. that was having very significant adverse impacts on species. That is, has been prohibited and the impacts of that activity going away have been pretty profound. So what new challenges impact the laws on species conservation right now? Uh, we have a lot of um, direct impacts that have been um, accounted for, but we have new challenges every day, including uh, challenges related to climate change. Um, ocean acidification is having um, terrible effects on our coral reefs. Um, it's uh, the, uh, the rising temperatures due to climate change is impacting the amount of ice we have in the Arctic. We have some marine mammal species that are very dependent on, on, on that. So we are um, looking at those new challenges and we are trying to focus on getting the science right and trying to figure out what we can do as a government and then what um, individuals in the science community can do to contribute to our knowledge and a strategy for, for conserving and recovering right. Right. these protected species. So Patrick, Eileen was just talking about indirect threat, threats, a lot of indirect threats. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, I mean obviously we have to worry about indirect threats, but we still have to worry about the direct threats as well. Can you, can you talk to us about what those are and what the difference is? Sure, as Eileen alluded to, um, when it comes to our planet's great whale species, perhaps the most obvious direct threat uh, that uh, most of us are familiar with, um, is whaling. And uh, the U.S. in more than a century of Yankee whaling um, was a world leader um, in killing whales for trade in their parts and products, uh, we and many other nations. Um, 
pushed our planet's great whale species right to the brink of extinction, uh, to lower than 10% of their um, historic numbers in many cases. Um, that was a massive threat. Thankfully, uh, with strong U.S. leadership uh, and other former uh, whaling nations putting down the harpoon mm -hmm. as well, um, that um, threat has been greatly reduced. Three countries today, Japan, Iceland, and Norway, persist in the killing of whales for commercial purposes. There are resurgent efforts, even as we sit here, uh, by Iceland um, and, and uh, one whaler there to renew the international trade in whale meat. So U.S. vigilance and strong U.S. conservation leadership um, is needed even against that age-old threat of commercial whaling. Over that period, though, and in over, the, over the period since the adoption of the Endangered Species and Marine Mammal Protection Acts in this country, um, a range of additional threats uh, have come into view. Um, entanglement in fishing gear is widely acknowledged as one of the most um, severe threats to marine mammal um, populations, whales um, and dolphins, um, killing untold thousands each year worldwide. Ship strikes, collisions with high-speed vessels also mm -hmm. pose a severe threat, um, particularly for species that tend to be moving in shallow waters near the shore, um, not far from our Washington, D.C. location here. Um, North Atlantic right whales migrate seasonally up and down the eastern seaboard of the United States. Very endangered whales, some 450 to 500 left. And um, ship strikes pose a real threat to that population. Ocean noise pollution, um, whether from seismic activity and exploration and drilling um, for uh, energy resources, uh, or some forms of Navy sonar um, used to detect quiet submarines and for other military national security purposes, have been shown to have very profound impacts on some deep diving species of whales. So more research is needed to identify the critical breeding, feeding, migration, and habitat areas for these animals and manage not just species, but manage the human activities mm -hmm. that are threatening uh, the very animals uh, who are right. part of our natural heritage right. and who we want to protect. So you mentioned the human activities. Uh, so Francis, y you know, you're a veterinarian. You're out there all the time. You're seeing the impacts that, that humans make on these marine mammals. Can you give us some of those examples uh, that you see that you save, save them from? Certainly. Um, so, so there are these indirect effects that are resulting from really the way that we, we're changing our coastal environment right. as well as the open waters. So we see think consequences of pollution, um, contaminants like DDTs and PCBs, although production has been banned, they're still present in the marine environment. Mm -hmm and they can, they can cause cancers, they can suppress the immune system. We're seeing an increase in harmful algal blooms, and these are um, algae that proliferate. They produce toxins that can then accumulate in the food chain and cause damage, uh, brain damage, seizures, um, large mortality events with hundreds of, sometimes up to thousands of mm -hmm. sea lions or dolphins stranding. And interestingly, we're also now seeing um, runoff of land-based pathogens, bacteria, into ocean waters. And we think that's really because of a loss of some of our, our tidal marshlands. So uh, a well-studied example is the case of uh, toxoplasma, which is a, a parasite in cat feces. And we're finding it as a major cause of mortality in not just sea otters in California, where there's runoff of water, but even in, in some Alaskan marine mammals, um, toxoplasma has been reported. So it's this runoff of organisms from land to sea, probably as we've changed our, our coastal habitat. Right. So, uh, Patrick, you, you mentioned earlier that you're working really hard, and I, I know for, for a fact that you worked really closely with the Stellag and Bank National Marine Sanctuary yes. uh, because they took a look at the, the right whale populations up there and where they were and determined, you know, we need to really do something about moving the shipping lane in and out of Boston. Can you tell us a little bit about that process and, and how it worked and the impact that it's made? Sure. Um, uh, our U.S. economy depends on shipping. Some 98% of the products that we import from other countries arrive by ship. Um, it's a hidden part of our economy, but a massive one. And it has a massive impact on the ocean environment. Um, it's speculated that some 60,000 uh, uh, merchant vessels at any given time are plying the world's seas um, with an impact on, on uh, ocean noise, the ocean environment, and, uh, if you'll pardon the expression, a, a very definite impact on species like the, the North Atlantic right whale. So years of, of research that we were pleased to contribute to, along with people like David Wiley, the head of research at Stellwagen National Bank and his team um, there, Chris Clark and Cornell, many other um, researchers, New England Aquarium and Scott Krauts were involved, um, led to a very uh, clear sense of concentrations of white, right whales in particular areas um, 
and unfortunately in the shipping lanes mm -hmm. um, that transect the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary um, just outside of the Port of Boston. And um, what was demonstrated is um, seasonally consistent um, concentrations where a small movement in shipping lane could make a big difference uh, for anyone concerned with protecting right whales. So by adjusting uh, uh, to a not very significant degree, it didn't add a lot of time or expense um, to uh, the mariner um, or the companies involved, um, there were routes established, ultimately promulgated and approved uh, via the U.S. delegation to the International Maritime Organization, which regulates shipping lanes worldwide, based in London. Um, and we've seen huge conservation benefit um, through careful study and collection of data, some of it federal, some of it nonprofit, some of it private citizens, um, contributing to a better understanding of the marine environment so that human activities which are necessary could be better oriented so as not to be having such a negative impact on whale species. It, it's a a potential inflection point for the endangered North Atlantic right whale. Um, and together with efforts by the fishing industry, we've worked closely with the Massachusetts Lobstermen Association on some gear modifications, pulling out moated gear out of the water, removing ghost gear, which poses a needless threat um, to endangered whale species who get entangled in gear that's long since been abandoned. Um, these kind of hopeful signs and sometimes um, mm. challenging and, and uh, unfamiliar coalitions are really where policy and science can come together in and on the water to make a difference for the species we're trying to protect. So Eileen, uh, listing, delisting, how does that happen? How, how do you determine which species goes on the list or comes off the list? Um, under the Endangered Species Act, there is a very specific procedure that's laid out for what criteria have to be met for a species to go on the list. And then uh, we have to develop a recovery plan and set criteria for when the species will be deemed to be recovered and taken off the list. So um, unfortunately, many species have continued to be added to the list, but we are, um, we are uh, starting to see some species recovery, and we do need to really remind everybody that it is possible for species to recover. It's not a one-way street to extinction, mm -hmm. and we do have some success stories. We did recently remove a population of, um, of stellar sea lions from um, the list. We have put out a new proposal to um, to look at humpback whales um, in a different way and to divide them up, not just look at the, the entire species, but at population segments. And some of those populations are doing quite well. Others will still um, require um, protection. And so we're looking for comments on, on that action. On the terrestrial side, the Fish and Wildlife Service does the same thing with terrestrial species. Um, but we are not just looking at our success in terms of um, getting species off the list, although that is our goal. Our goal is to recover and, and really have these species not need federal protection. Um, but we are looking at the trends of species that are heading downhill way too fast, and we're trying to identify a handful of those where we can really make a difference in, um, in a concentrated period of time, just as we've been describing with respect mm -hmm. to northern right whales, um, to look at a handful of species at a time and really see if we can find those inflection points and by we, I don't just mean the federal government. I mean our partners, like the Marine Mammal Center, um, like your organization, um, individual citizens, where if we just concentrate and work on a couple of stressors for northern right whales, it was the fishing industry and the shipping industry. Let's, let's focus on those for a, a focused period of time and, and try to make a difference. So we at NOAA Fisheries just recently came out with a, um, a new initiative, Spotlight Species, um, um, where we identified eight species three marine mammals, uh, three fish species, salmon species, uh, one invertebrate, the white abalone, and um, one sea turtle species. And many of these species are located in or near um, national marine sanctuaries. So we are looking to partner on those eight mm -hmm. species speci specifically. And we have some successes um, on one of them, the Hawaiian monk seal, with mm -hmm. the Marine Mammal Center already under yeah. our belts. So speaking of the, the the Hawaiian monk seal. Uh, Francis, I know you've done work up at the Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, what you're working on up there and, and what you're doing to help protect that species in particular? Yes, this is almost the, the opposite extreme from, from sort of large government. This is a very hands-on um, practical effort mm -hmm. to save individual monk seals. So the monk seal population is critically endangered. There are about a, about a thousand animals left and most of the population is up in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands and, and within the monument, with a small population down in the main Hawaiian Islands where there's a lot of interaction with people. 
So ironically, there is more mortality up in the in the Northwesterns, and those pups, um, they they become entangled, they face um, food shortages, they are attacked by sharks. So we, the Marine Mammal Center, has built a hospital for these seals on Kona, on the Big Island, and we took the experience that we had gained by working on um, harbor seals and elephant seals in California, which are recovered pinniped species. So we took that expertise and we sort of rallied our volunteer forces, built this hospital, and in partnership with NOAA, NOAA has brought the seals needing treatment down to our hospital, and then we have treated them, and then NOAA has taken them back up to the islands. And so that has been a really wonderful example of a, of a government-private partnership. We've also worked with the Coast Guard and with the state to actually transfer the animals to and from their beaches. So it's, um, it's a very practical, real thing. You can see a seal come in, um, you know, 18 kilos, very skinny, probably going to die in the next few weeks, to being released several months later, um, five times the weight, fat female who hopefully will go on to breed and contribute to that population. You mentioned volunteers. We, uh, you know, in sanctuaries, we, it's our bread and butter is because w mm -hmm. we don't have the hands to be able to do everything that we need to do to help protect the resource. So we really rely on our volunteers, um, hundreds of them across the country. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about the volunteers and what they do for, for you in this effort? So at the, at the Murillo Center, our volunteers really are integrated into every part of our program. They they drive trucks to transport animals, they clean pens, they feed animals, they assist vets with, with veterinary care. Mm -hmm. um, and they're also involved in our education and outreach programs and also with fundraising and just getting the message out to the public about these animals and what we can do to protect them. Right. Well, so Patrick, I want to go back to some of the things you said earlier about noise and I think I don't think people understand, you know, Sound travels pretty fast uh, in water, sure. and so you, if you think about it, there's how much noise there pollution that's going on in the ocean. Uh, you have worked very closely with a whole bunch of partners to develop this whale alert app, can, specifically for the North Atlantic right whales. Can you tell us a little bit more about that app and what it's doing? Sure. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to make some noise about the whale alert app, which is mostly focused on um, tracking of of whales and helping. Um, avoid the threat of um, ship strikes, but um, uh, ship, global shipping, um, as I earlier alluded to, is in fact the principal contributor to the change in noise levels in our planet's oceans. Some species of whales live to be 150 or 200 years old. When those whales were teenagers, the ocean was quiet, and their acoustic environment is very different now. And just as air, in which we're speaking, is a brilliant medium for, for um, uh, vision, um, and us, you know, seeing uh, millions of light years, uh, the water is a brilliant medium for sound. Whales are specially evolved and adapted um, uh, uh, for that. Um, the whale alert uh, app that you allude to also, in part, depends on sound. And what this is, Kate, is a um, really state-of-the-art, 21st century, handheld conservation whale conservation tool. Um, it's a free download from uh, the Apple Store, or as of yesterday at the inauguration of uh, Oceans, uh, Capitol Hill Oceans Week 2015, we made it available on Android and Google Play. And um, you can download um, this app. Its initial audience was mariners on the deck of a ship who wanted a, a, a uh, heads up resource to be able to see the overlay of where whales have been heard or sighted where um, speed restrictions or um, lane markings are located. And we've also included in this latest version NOAA ports data, so, so time and tide data for each of the major ports around the United States, both east and west coast. Importantly, though, and with um, marine mammal responders from my organization, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, Marine Mammal Center, and so many other um, groups involved in that practice on both coasts, um, there are um, guides for individual uh, whale enthusiasts um, on either coast when they cite a whale to identify it and immediately report to um, their local stranding response team the presence of a marine mammal on a beach. Um, the data that they upload when they see the location of the whale, take its picture or whatever, also contributes to the very same data that helps with the movement of shipping lanes or what have you. Um, so it's quite a, uh, a capable app. It's a free um, download. We've got more than 50,000 downloads already, something we encourage all of your viewers to take advantage of, Whale Alert. Nice. Well, it, it, 
you're just talking about citizen science and all these things. How can, just taking the example of your work with Whale App, the Whale App, uh, how, Whale Alert App, how can we say, okay, government, okay, nonprofit, okay, average citizen, why is it important for all of us to work together on this topic? I mean, from volunteering to your sighting on your whale app, what, what, what do we, how, why is that important? Well, as both, as both Eileen and Francis, yeah. um, I won't be an air hog, but yeah. just as Eileen and Francis have, have both alluded to, I mean, these, these animals today face more threats than at any time in history. And the United States is lucky. We have these two model pieces of legislation, the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. They're world-class policy and world-class science are fantastic. U.S. leadership is needed, but it's not enough. There needs to be citizen engagement, personal engagement, whether in, the, in, in voting for our elected leaders, um, in public comments on the latest humpback proposal or many other proposals that are put there. Um, our politicians need to know that there continues to be strong concern for the protection of these species in order to continue this proud conservation legacy going forward. Eileen? I think some of our biggest successes have highlighted the fact that government can't do it alone, Private, the private sector can't really do it alone, that it's all about partnerships. We each have a piece to play and it works better when we're all coordinated and we kind of identify who can do what. Um, for our eight spotlight species, we have um, a web page for each of those species and we are trying to step it down to um, identify what individuals, organizations, um, states and, and, and um, agencies can do. So we want everybody to be part of this. Great, and Francis? I, I would echo the partnerships, but I think we really have to think of the next generation, the generation after that. And every time we lose a species, it's like another light has just blinked out around the world. So I would love for us to all together be able to leave some of those lights on for future generations. Wonderful, well said, thank you very much. I'm glad we got the chance to explore new currents in uh, marine and protected species conservation. As a nation, we have to look at how we can manage both direct and indirect threats under our existing laws and through the creation of new diverse coalitions. Eileen, Francis, Patrick, thank you so much for joining me to talk about this amazing topic and very, very important topic. So day two of Chow concludes with ensuring sustainable U.S. seafood supply at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please visit OceansLive.org tomorrow for the final day of Chow beginning at 9.30 a.m. Until then, thank you for watching and have an ocean-tastic evening.